Hello again, it's Philip Campion welcoming you back to the Great Academy for a reading of D.H. Lawrence's poem, Snake. This is again going to help to develop your critical literacy, as well as really bring you in to what's happening in this fine poem, Snake, by D.H. Lawrence. There's a nice image for you as it approaches the shop. So it's a poem about an uninvited guest, as I say. Sort of. But here's a question for you. Who is the uninvited guest in that scene? You tell me. Hey, I suggest you write your own personal ideas about this after the video. Might be fun and developmental for you. Is it a poetic tale or is it a full-on drama? That's what I ask you. Is it simply narrated or is it dramatic? What do you think? And another question. Do you share any of Lawrence's emotions as revealed in the poem? Snake examines an encounter, right? Between Lawrence and the reptile world. The meeting with the snake at the water trough provides two wonders, the observation of the drinking snake and the display of the poet's talent through his descriptive language and imagery. So the whole aesthetic aspect of the poem, as well as what's actually dramatized in the content. Hope you get that. Two levels of experiencing this poem, especially if you, ha if you have now started to develop critical literacy, so you can begin to appreciate the poet's talent as conveyed to the fantastic language and really striking images. Besides being a celebration of a creature in language, this is a poem about a moment in time and a poem about otherness. Do you ever think of the notion of otherness? You have yourself, your subjective self, but can you ever project yourself towards the other and realize their otherness, whether it's a person or a creature? and to appreciate that otherness. Now, in that little comment there, there are three things in it for you. Language, time, and otherness, yeah? It's a little bit of a quote. He reached down from a fissure in the earth wall in the gloom and trailed his yellow-brown flatness soft-bellied down over the edge of the stone trough and rested his throat upon the stone bottom and where the water had dripped from the tap in a small clearness he sipped with his with his straight mouth softly drank through his straight gums into his slack long body silently now to get any repetition going on there the description of the body yeah, of the snake. The word slackness and slack, for example. You might get the lack of rhyme, but there's this kind of a rhythm of repetition going through it. You almost get the sense of the wriggle of the snake with the kind of the long trailing phrases. Yellow, brown, slackness, soft belly, down, over the edge of the stone trough. Any full stops in there, by the way. Have a look at it again. See, tell me what you think. What's the effect of, of the after full stops? What do you think? How does that kind of suit a subject matter? That other, that intruder that came to drink. Is the nature of that other creature anyway captured, therefore, in the structure and form of the expression there? What other repetitions do you see there besides the one of, ones I've, I've just tapped into? So, I've been saying that really, haven't I? The form in this poem mirrors its content, free verse. The absence of a specific rhyme pattern allows for a supple flow like the movement of a snake, as do the long sentences. So, the poet begins with a touch of drama, yeah? A, a surprise. Part of the dramatic quality is how he sets a day and location. A hot, hot day at a well in Sicily. His imagery is visual, of course, isn't it? You can see it in your mind's eye from the words, and brings the reader to Lawrence's well located in the deep, strange, scented shade of the great dark carob tree. So it's a well that's well located for you. You get a sense of smell as well as touch, the touch from the hot day, the heat. So three of the senses are strongly evoked. No sound as yet. So 
Father Lawrence has come to his everyday water trough to fill his pitcher with water. But the use of the word pitcher, is he already drawing attention to the fact that he is painting a picture for the reader? That's up to you whether you want to delve into language in that way. A surprise awaits him on this particular day. Out of a crevice, a snake has emerged, and Lawrence realises he has to wait. He has to wait. He simply must wait, must stand and wait in line at the trough. How many people would have, especially a hundred years ago, taken that approach to a snake? Habit has given Lawrence a sense of ownership of the place. But maybe the snake, though not registering the intrusive human, Lawrence, feels it's the familiar in the place. Who knows? Who can know? The rule of before me applies. Though the phrase also means in front of me. Queuing like this for an animal to complete its business would have been considered unusual when Lawrence wrote this poem, as I say, pretty much a century ago. It was in Sicily from about 1920 to 1922 or 3. And that's where the experience happened and where he wrote the poem, publishing it in 1923. Anyhow, this scene is set, the scene is set for a drama. After the astonishing apparition of the snake, Lawrence realises, someone was before me at my water trough, not the word my, and I, like a second comer, waiting. So there's a humility there as well, an ability to flip into just standby mode, observing, respecting, yeah? Does he use this word, it? No. What pronoun does he use? He uses he, and he uses the word someone. So, he treats it as a fellow creature. Look at that beautiful language I have already read. Read it to yourself aloud. Savor it. Hear it. Feel it. Enter into it. Look at the beautiful image, imagery. The striking imagery. How precise Lawrence's description is. You know, it's like focusing the camera and getting it absolutely dead sharp. Nothing vague about his words. You know, some poets like to suggest, but Lawrence, maybe he suggests things underneath the words, but the words themselves are very, very precise, photographic. The motions of the snake come alive for the reader from the expert words of Lawrence. And where the water had dripped from the tap in a small clearness, he softly drank through his straight gums into his slack, long body silently. Appreciate those words. How specific they are. The lovely sound effect. You know, the S sounds. We're making the snake's potential hiss if it responds to an intruder getting too close. Otherwise, the reptile is in its own world, silent. And the gums are very striking. Straight gums. Lawrence is aware of his otherness to the snake, capturing its point of view too. He lifted his head from his drinking as cattle do and looked at me vaguely, as drinking cattle do. That's a sort of simile as well there to kind of get across, you know, uh, people unfamiliar with the snake, but they would have been very unfamiliar to get across the creaturely behaviour, looking at Lawrence as the other, vaguely interested. <laughs> it's interesting. Enjoy the beauty of this description. Is there any sound that's rather impressive there in terms of creating a, a, an impact? Did you say that the word earth is used three times? Well said. Did, did you like the notion of the burning bowel of the earth, the notion of underneath the crust of the earth? You know, it's bowels like our system. You know, If you have a burning bowel, you've got diarrhea, you've got an awful kind of sensation. And that the earth has something like that in it. And what happens when you have diarrhea? No need to say it, is it. What does the earth do when it has diarrhea? Well, it spurts out a in a volcano, and that comes up in the next line. So the imagery is so good. But there's something else in there, too. There's a sound effect, isn't there? Besides what I've mentioned. Have you got it? You've said it, haven't you?
I mentioned that point, by the way. Yes, you got it, didn't you? Didn't you? Four uses a B to kind of just musically cohere the whole thing. The setting is then rendered more dramatic and significant on the day of Sicilian July with Etna smoking. Remember what I mentioned about the burning bells? Etna, Mount Etna, the famous volcano in the setting of Sicily. So the snake is somehow associated with that, coming from the burning bowels of the earth. And that suggests the latent sort of danger of the snake as well, isn't it? If interfered with, and how it belongs in there, the world that it comes from. Fascinating. So what an imagination at work here. Yeah, the, the language echoing as well. There was an image of Etna erupting. An eternal debate, like in other poems, a conflict starts between Lawrence and his cultural conditioning with his golden rules. Remember the internal debate before between past and present in piano? Well, here's an internal debate. The voice of my education said to me, he must be killed. For in Sicily, the black, black snakes are innocent. The gold are venomous. But the repetition in there as well. Not that kind of a, the adamant expression, almost like, you know, Somebody kind of uh, imperatively speaking, he must be killed. The voice, you know, so the inner voices are captured there in his mind, added to the drama, yeah? And the whole theme there of education versus instinct. Fascinating aspect of the poem, isn't it? So, inner voices heighten the suspense of the drama. And Vice Limit said, if you were a man, you would take a stick and break him now and finish him off. The Bible myth of the Garden of Eden painted snakes as the villains of the animal kingdom. Remember that? So there's a brainwash in there, religious and cultural education. So much cultural indoctrination is founded on fear of the other, isn't it? The outsider. How often... Do you think about people in other countries and have some idea of them, stereotype them? They're outsiders. You don't know them from their inside and you form an easy judgment. You know, it happens with people as it is with animals, isn't it? And Lawrence is, is really teaching us something, how cultural indoctrination can block us off from encounters with the other, with the outsider. It's so true of Lawrence, isn't it, at that point? He must wrestle with his cultural fear of snakes. He's very candid about this. And his own impulse to admire and respect the snake. So there's two things there. His cultural fear and his impulse to admire and respect the snake as an honoured guest. Is he the honoured guest or is the snake the honoured guest? Who's the guest? That's the nice ambiguity. Largely, I suppose, from the point of view of the, sort of, of the way the poem is declared, the way the speaker speaks, the snake is the honoured guest and should be honoured. And the poet feels honoured that, that the snake should seek my hospitality. But hospitality is a misleading word in terms of what happens later. The twist in the poem, yeah? Like the twist of a snake. There's a big twist in the poem. So the drama of this internal debate, one designed to cause the reader to reflect on nature's creatures. And note also three rhetorical questions and an epiphany in this quote. Was it cowardice that I dared not kill him? Was it perversity that I longed to talk to him? Now, you would say, of course, you know, we're living the age of, of, of Greta Thunberg and so many others who have influenced us to completely look at the earth in a different way. Wouldn't you say it was perversity to want to harm the snake? But in Lawrence's conditioning a century ago, it might be considered perversity by the reader. You know, a, a, a twisted approach, that's what perversity means, that I long to talk to him. And this all reversed as the century has gone on for you as a reader, as I say. So back to his questions. His third one, was it humility to feel so honoured? Yes. And he's trying to draw the reader into accepting the snake and its otherness and saying that, you know, we must be humble in front of these creatures. But instead of being preachy, he's asking, he's using all these rhetorical questions to provoke so much within the readers. And then I felt so honoured. The epiphany. That's the moment. I felt so honoured. A sudden realisation of the majesty of the creature. But this epiphany doesn't stay with him. The mental drama scales up the tension. And yet those voices... If you were not afraid, you would kill him. <laughs> the internal monologue 
all those voices. Reveal the struggle of ideals versus values. His ideal is to want to cherish the creature. The values are given to him by his indoctrination, by the Bible, by society, by the general attitude against snakes. And it's all complicated by instinct. Now, my misspelling that's there, instincts, I hope that will actually, you know, as I correct it now, remind you that, in fact, you know, in instinct is a complicating aspect in the poem. So complicated, I misspelled it there. Anyway, and truly, I was afraid. I was most afraid. But even so, honoured still more that he should seek my hospitality from out of the dark door of the secret earth. Now, I haven't commented on the image in the last line just now, but I have been commenting a lot in the first three lines of that there, in the run-up to the slide, haven't I? And isn't there a lovely mystery created to conjure their secret heart, the dark door of the secret earth? Isn't that a fantastic image that a child would be absolutely, you know, entranced by? And there's a, a nice echoed image of the dark door, you know, go back to the fissure in the wall, etc. The enchanting, mysterious creature mesmerizes the poet in its, in its exotic otherness. The beautiful imagery. Read it aloud to yourself. Catch the sound. Flick at his tongue like a fork tonight. Get the Fs and all of that exquisite like that music. Read it to yourself. And now I'll read it, but I can't resist it. And lifted his head dreamily as one who was drunken, and flickered his tongue like a fortnight on the air so black, seeming to lick his lips, and looked around like a god unseeing into the air. So much music, so much echo in there, so much you can write about, so exquisite. You do what you like with that. The language which captures how the how mesmerized the poet is. And here is where, you know, emphasizing, you know, what I said earlier on that the poem is not just about the exotic snake, but the exotic aesthetic language. And here it is, the language of Lawrence, creating an absolute mesmerizing experience for the reader. And it's followed by exquisite sensual description. And slowly, very slowly, as if th thrice a dream get the repetition from dream above and slowly very slowly as if tr thrice a dream proceeded to draw his slow length curving round and climb again the broken bank of my wall face snake easing his shoulders look at that lovely invention of language snake easing isn't he a marvelous deployer of words of language of phrases D. H. lawrence just appreciate the music of that the mood of it and how graphic it is in capturing the very movement of the snake at that moment. But Lawrence's dark side, the one that his culture and education cultivated in him, leads to an ugly impulse. A sort of horror, a sort of protest against his withdrawing into that horrid black hole. Deliberately going into the blackness and slowly drawing himself after. Overcame me. Now his back was turned. Get that nice little phrase. Now his back was turned. Suddenly he became brave. But you get that sense of kind of uh, resentment that he has about the snake, resentment maybe at himself for having humbly welcomed him as a guest and suddenly his conditioning. But he's dramatizing something for the reader and dramatizing something that's in a lot of the readers, a prejudice against snakes, in order maybe to highlight it through this almost exaggeration of language. Enjoy the drama. You know, the repetition of horror, horrid. You know, the black hole again, the blackness. The decisive action of the drama arrives. When the snake begins to withdraw into that horrid black hole in the earth and becomes a real and become a real snake, as opposed to the imagined godlike being that the boat invented. Lawrence begins to heed the voices of his education. I picked up a clumsy log and threw it at the water trough. The divine aura built around the reptile vanishes as its impulsive struggle for survival takes over. Suddenly, that part of him that was left behind convulsed in an undignified haste, writhing, rided like lightning, and was gone into the black hole, the earth lipped fissure. What? All of that repetition of many images before. The nice, like phrase, a nice phrase, writhed for the snake's movement, like lightning, the sudden uh, 
opposite to the sort of lingering, luxurious way it had moved earlier on in that exquisite description. Convulsed, rather, you know, the undignified haste as well is interesting because it's so different. It's a completely different a change of mood and it's the opposite to the sense of, of dignity and majesty that was uh, earlier evoked. Tiny note, a uh, little mechanical error there on top with the, the, uh, um, with the it's. Um, it's a grammar error, yes, but don't worry about it. Even if I can make a grammar error like that, so can you, the odd timer. Maybe the system made it for me as I was making it. I didn't spot it. So I'm, I'm just pedantically drawing attention to that to let you know that mechanics is an aspect of marking. It's 10% of the marks assigned for any question, but you have to have four of them to lose one mark. Just keep that in mind. Be as careful as you can. Edit them, reduce them, but it makes an overall impression. There you are. Say no more. What a dramatic symbol, yes, that's, that's in that. Like, ride it like lightning. As I said, lots of repetition. Immediately, Lawrence regrets the impulsive action and castigates, which means gives out to himself for such an ignoble act. I thought, how paltry, how vulgar, what a mean act. So, the poet experiences a belated crisis of conscience after what he's done. The speaker reflects on an opportunity lost, a violation he cannot forgive himself for. For he seemed to me again like a king. Like a king in exile. Lovely repetition, yes. And a king in exile. That's a very fascinating image, isn't it? Uncrowned in the underworld. Now due to be crowned again. So when he goes back inside, he'll, he'll have his dignity intact. He'll have his place. And he's the king of that underworld, as it were. Like the lion is the king of the jungle. It's a fascinating image, isn't it? Nobody would have seen that when Lawrence wrote this poem. That notion of the kingliness of a reptile. Beautiful, isn't it? The poem is a warning about not taking opportunities too, so isn't it? That stupid impulse of actions cannot be undone. That's in it too. The poem is quite didactic. It means it tends to teach us something. The poem is quite didactic in nature and tone now. He has thrown away an opportunity for a mutual rapport through staring. But there was that mutual rapport when they stared at each other. But it was... Uh, you know, a, a rapport of the mind that would not have communicated, but that staring was somehow a, for, a connection between them. But he's thrown away that opportunity for that mutual rapport. And his, uh, and his appreciation of the mystery of otherness has been compromised by his own actions, throwing that log. Not by the snakes. Did the snake do anything to threaten him? No, the snake simply withdrew in haste when it was under attack. So, the interesting thing too, is that the nastiness was human here. Not on the part of the snake at all. The snake didn't even do anything sneaky, like in the old Garden of Eden thing. So, Lawrence says, and so I miss my chance with one of the lords of life. Another profound epiphany. The poem ends with a bitter reflection that he has betrayed his, responsi his responsibility to nature. He let himself down, he, and that he has shown a pettiness. To quote, the, hon the honesty of the poet's self-criticism is a way to communicate with the reader, a persuasive attempt to change cultural attitudes. How paltry, how vulgar, what a mean act. So now, write a paragraph or imagine this as an online post on the question I posed at the start for you, which is, which of them was the uninvited guest here, the man or the snake? Refer to the poem at least a bit while drafting your answer. A bit of practice for uh, reflecting in an exam scenario too. Or, you know, a bit of practice for what you'll eventually write for your teacher to impress her or to impress him. Just do this for yourself. It doesn't matter that nobody else is going to see it but you. Just imagine the snake looking over your shoulder, hissing at you if you don't do a good job. Huh? So? Over and out for now from Philip Campion of the Great Academy. And happy learning in the meantime until you meet me for another presentation. <laughs>